Good evening and welcome to the Saren online launch of uh, Judy's, Judy Brown's third collection, Layers. Um, as you may know, Judy's first Saren collection, Loudness, was shortlisted for the Forward and the Albra Prize for Best First Collection. Her second collection, Crowd Sensations, in 2016, was shortlisted for the Lebri Forte Prize and was a PBS recommendation. And now we have this incredible third collection, Layers. Judy has won the Manchester Poetry Prize and the Poetry London Competition. She was also the poet in residence at the Wordsworth Trust during 2013 and at the Gladstone Library in June 2014. During the writing of this book, she held a six-week art and culture residency in Exeter University's Institute of Data Science and Artificial Intelligence, working with Professor Peter Challoner, who is here this evening, who is one of our guests tonight. More about Les. So Lairs brings together something that is both pi primal and secret. The lair is haven for a wild or feral animal, with a poem framed as a mathematical equation. In these terms, the lair is a kind of nest, a beautiful accumulation of dense detail. The tension between order and disorder in these poems is informed by the mathematics after Judy's residency at Exeter. There she was inspired by specialists in uncertainty quantification a branch of mathematics that seeks to estimate the uncertainty on predictions made by computer models. You'll learn more about this later from Peter, and we'll hear one or two of the poems the residency inspired. The poems are introspective, by turns analytical, fearful, and mocking in their response to the systems shaping an altered world. The use of language is innovative, while maintaining moments of vulnerability and moving self-awareness. In these exquisite poems, the lair is both the community at large and a dark and intricate interior space where something wild still survives. So on that note, please let me introduce Judy Brown. Oh. Judy, I think you're on mute. Supposed to not do. Sorry, that was exactly the thing I shouldn't have done. <laughs> I just wanted to thank you very quickly for being here tonight and to say, as well as launching my book, it, I'm really glad to have the opportunity to celebrate some of the people that inspired and collaborated with me in ways that shaped this book. So I've got three talented guests who all, unlike me, have skills in several fields. We have Barbara Marsh, a, a poet musician. We have um, Professor Peter Challoner, who is a, um, a mathematician and reader of poetry, and Professor Beth Wingate, who's a mathematician and poet. So I'm going to pass you back to Rian to, hand, to introduce Barbara. Welcome back to me. So I keep muting myself because I have a very loquacious dog who's willing to bark at any second. So let me introduce you to Barbara Marsh. Barbara is a poet, musician and teacher who now lives in France. Her collection to the Boneyard and her pamphlet, Mr. Ferndean Takes Stock, are published by Eyewear and we'll have links in the chat. She won the Troubadour International Poetry Prize in 2015. In the music world, she co-founded The Dear Janes and her current band, The Franklins, recently released their debut album, Eternity Pool, on Rotary Head Records. So please let me introduce Barbara Marsh. Thank you, Rian and Judy. <laughs> okay. um, Judy, thank you so much for inviting me here. I, I'm just honored, honored, honored to be here. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so now I've just got to, oh yeah, I put them behind the screen share. Um, okay, I'm just putting the stopwatch on. We were talking about this earlier. Okay, um, I'll, uh, the the poems um, tonight, um, I, I feel like it seems like I might have lost my sense of humor somewhere along the way, but there's one of them that's mildly humorous, um, sort of, if you have my sense of humor. <laughs> they tend to um, to look at memory I think as, as much as anything else if it's thematic in any way it's thematic like that so I'm just going to put up this um, I'm sharing it myself I'll just make it a little bigger so then I'll read it and yes it's telling me what it is. okay so this first one comes from um something that may a memory that may or may not have existed and that that happens in a few of the poems and this is called Late Afternoon. Oh, it's coming out in the, it's in the, the current issue of the North as well. Late Afternoon. When the light hovers over the apple trees and then descends for a few moments, 
into their leaves and the grass and the roof of the barn. I am swept back to a place I think I remember, the color of soft heat, the glow of a green gauge. Water laps below a lighthouse and I am dizzy, scaling its height with my early eyes, the promise of a big sky, how the land moves and waves and folds beneath, the color of our family retriever. The sea, only just over that hill, reflects itself back into the sky, sings the possible, and holds its breath for long, luxurious seconds. And the last poem a kind of harks back to the first one in this little set. Um, one of the places that we lived was uh, Lubeck, Maine, which is um, also the, 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 the place for the kind of imagined information, if you like, um, in the poem that, that, that won the troubadour. But um, anyway, this was in the, as a finalist in the Ms. Lexia comp this year. This is called House in Lubeck. And then there was a small shoe. And then there were baby fingernails. And then there was a lock of my own hair lost in the back garden, overlooking the sea where I have almost never been. I was almost never there, except when I was so small, it was before I had the language to make a memory. I search every day, and all I have is what I am not sure of. No one is alive who can tell me where the house was, the street, the number, the body of water it backed onto. I can see the staircase unfolding below my little legs, and that is all. And then there was a blanket, pink, I expect. And then there was a Christmas tree with boughs low enough for me to hang baubles. And then there were my mother's pearls, but that was later, each one imbued with her presence, she who held on to my memories. And now they are mine, the color of snow, the brilliance crusting over the wood pile in the winter sun, holding all the places I lived but never knew, all those streets, all that water. Thank you. Thanks so much, Barbara. That is that's lovely. I've and I've um, Barbara and I sh have shared poems for many years, but we spent like every Monday afternoon talking on Zoom while I was writing this book, and I was very grateful for all the thoughts and just the the kind of constant discussion. So thank you so much for for reading. I'm now going to introduce some mathematics into the into um, this launch. We've got two mathematicians here, as I say, um, Professor Peter Challoner and um, Professor Beth Wingate. Beth's going to read us some poems after Peter and I've talked a bit, but I'm going to give you both their um, both their bios. Peter's a professor of statistics in the mathematics and statistics department at the University of Exeter. He's a member of the university's Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence, and his research interest is how we make decisions when the evidence is uncertain, particularly when it comes from a computationally expensive model. And um, Peter was the person, the lead person in the in my residency, and spent an enormous amount of time telling me the most fantastic things in as clear as possible language as one could could be imagined from somebody who knows an enormous amount about, about maths to somebody who knows, knows nothing. And he also introduced me to lots of other people um, with the assistance of Sarah Campbell, who I think is also here. One of those people is the poet and mathematician um, Beth Wingate, who works, who writes as B.A. Wingate. Um, B.A. Wingate is a poet and mathematician currently living in Devon, England, where she works as a professor of mathematics. Her poetry is appeared in literary journals such as Prairie Schooner, the Iowa Review, the Santa Fe Literary Review, Natural Bridge and others. So thank you both for being here. And we're going to first um, have Peter perhaps explaining a little bit about the world in which he showed, the world which he showed to me when I went to Exeter for six weeks um, with a pen and a great deal of paper. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. So what do I do? Well, 
as I as I put in that brief bio, um, when people make decisions these days, decision makers we call them, decision makers who make decisions. And they could be anybody. They could be politicians. They could be engineers. They could be anything. But often they use these really complicated mathematical models to help make those decisions, like the models, the ones people probably know about are weather forecast models or climate models. And these are big things that they solve thousands of equations on the biggest computers in the world. And when you make that decision, you want to know how good the evidence is coming from that huge computer program. Um, and the naive way to do that would be what's called Monte Carlo. You sample from some statistical distribution, you pass it through this really expensive model, and you get some numbers at the other side. To do that, you need to run that model tens of thousands of times. So you can't do it because these models are incredibly expensive. They take hours to months on big computers. So what we do is we work out ways to we model the model. We build surrogate models or emulators, we call them, and they're really fast. So you've gone from a supercomputer to a laptop. So now we can run it thousands and thousands of times. Everything's a bit more uncertain. We first we fuzzied everything up, but they are now we have these surrogate models and they allow us to do these calculations we couldn't otherwise do. Now that's a very technical thing. <laughs> How we do that is very technical. It involves things called Gaussian processes and Bayesian statistics. And, and I could bore you for hours about that, but you don't want to be bored for us because you want to listen to nice poems. Um, but that's what I do. Um, and the Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence, the university gave us an arts, an arts fellowship. <laughs> and for some reason, the institute thought I was the best person to do this as those people in the institute. So they gave it to me. <laughs> And then we, we advertised, and I never expected to get a poet. <laughs> I really thought I was going to get someone who was going to, a graphics person to explain, help me explain my stuff to the world. But I'm so glad I got a poet because it was so much fun. <laughs> so Judy and I would sit in my office with our whiteboard, and she would ask questions, and I would give an answer, which usually was fairly inadequate, I suspect, to start with. Um, and she asked all those questions that people don't ask <laughs> or my students don't ask. Um, and it was wonderful fun explaining stuff in very non tech trying to explain stuff in very non-technical language. We talked a lot about metaphor. We talked about how you explain stuff. Um, <coughs> but she never asked a stupid question because there are no stupid questions. <laughs> and I say it, it was it was when I've worked with a few artists, but this has been the most exciting and, and fun thing I've ever done like, <laughs> in that way. And um, say we would sit down and we would I would explain stuff and then she would go away and then she'd come back with more questions, <laughs> which were even better. And then she'd go and talk to my students or my postdocs. And we all loved it. <laughs> um, so some of my postdocs, well, some of my students and postdocs were really when I said, oh, we've got a poet coming to work with us, they were really very sceptical. <laughs> but they were all converted. Um, so we met separately and together. And um, yeah, it was it was really good. And I've learned a lot about how to explain my stuff. <laughs> because Judy has a wonderful turn of phrase. Um, there's a diagram we do, which, which I should have probably put on the slide, where there's a curve and then there's the uncertainty bounds on that curve and they go back to zero in these points and i've always thought of those as sausages they're not very good. oh sarah's sarah's actually got a one of my drawings from my notebook of that thing so it's not oh, as good you? as your diagram but she could probably <laughs> show us it and is it oh not that one no that's not the one it's the one the, the green one 
Have you got it there? I, I thought about putting a slide. It's very hard for a mathematician not to have slides, but I thought I wouldn't do it. <laughs> anyway, this yeah, thing wait. comes down. And Judy said, that's like washing on a line where the pegs are there and the sheets are blowing out between them. And I use that all the time now. <laughs> it's just such a wonderful way of explaining the sort of stuff that I do. So I said, what I do is very, very technical. And, oh, is this it? Yes, yes. That's it. <laughs> so that line down the middle is my emulator, my surrogate model, and the green is the uncertainty around that curve that's fitting to the data. And say so we talked an awful lot about that. Uh, and I have to say, Judy, this is amazing notebooks. I want notebooks like that. <laughs> um, I want to use watercolors in my notebooks, but no. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard um yeah someone's put up on the on the chat and we did actually film one of these sessions where we talked on the whiteboard and that was great fun i think we went through three whiteboards <laughs> yeah there's that was really fun actually the sort of the, the kind of me looking slightly daunted and Peter looking <laughs> very enthusiastic and generally kind of just carrying me through this um this kind of maze because it very much was for me, it was like this feeling of like having been slightly allowed to enter something that I knew really I didn't have the equipment to deal with. But it was a bit like um, I know Millie's here and Millie always had this kind of um, reference to like it was like going to um, Narnia and being kings and queens for like, 50 <laughs> years. And then you come back and you're just like a schoolboy in detention. And it was very like that. It was kind of magical. Well, I'm glad that was that was. It was magical for us as well, I have to say. It was it was great fun. Um, I've worked with some artists before, and it wasn't great fun. They they wanted me to, as were some visual artists, and they wanted me to solve some geometry problems for them, which I did. But <laughs> that wasn't quite the same. But we did have these wonderful, say, these wonderful conversations, and I learned a lot. And I, I know Judy, Judy learned a lot, but God, yes. I learned a lot from you. Um, Partly because you made me rethink about what I was talking about and what was what I actually do. <laughs> I thought a lot about that more deeply than I normally do. Um, and I, I like explaining it to people. Um, and I enjoyed explaining it to someone where there was a sort of continuing relationship. Often I explain it to people once and that's it. But you kept coming back. <laughs> <laughs> no well it was it was really great and thank you so much it's just fantastic for me um and I still I actually I was I was looking at the notebook that I kept while I was there and and I can see how so many of the poems that I've written have their sort of genesis in in those sort of scribblings while I was desperately trying to write down what you said and <laughs> asking you what a Gaussian process was because we thought at the end of this we might um read a, read one of the poems but when you've had the background for Peter and I did there is actually a poem which is kind of about Gaussian processes because I was always wanting to know what they were and saying <laughs> like what's in there you know how many dimensions are there what does it smell like is it infinite you know and eventually Peter finally I said something and Peter said yes it is and I was like okay that's, that's <laughs> as much as I'm gonna understand I think that was the best question I've ever been asked is what does a Gaussian process smell like <laughs> Well, there's, there's certainly a poem about that, but I wondered whether we might um, have one of the, because you talked about the computationally expensive models, um, that question about the the example you gave, and I don't know if you want to give a bit of background to that, about the model that is used in um, repairing heart damage after after heart attacks might might be. Um, yeah, okay. So might read that one, maybe. one of the models I was working on at the time, I don't do much on heart at the moment but it's a cardiac model so it's a model of the human heart and we were doing i, I can't which one which example judy wants to talk about there's a couple of ones we do one thing we did where we were trying to separate people who had heart disease from people who didn't have heart disease by fitting this model which which is just does one heartbeat Takes six hours to do one hardly. <laughs> I said these were expensive. You work a lot faster than the computers. Um, so this did six hours to do the heartbeat. But I think maybe the example Judy's thinking of is that there's another model 
that I don't do, one of my colleagues does, where when they're going to put a stent in your heart, and the stent is a little balloon that spans and so the artery, blood can flow through the artery, where it was blocked before with cholesterol and stuff. And they run a model that says whether they can do open heart, whether they need to do open heart surgery or they can do keyhole surgery. And that, I think, shows what the sort of things we're talking about, <laughs> that we can change people's lives by doing these modelling. But you always have to remember, and this is my big thing I, I talk about all the time, these models are not the same as the human heart. <laughs> they are models. And you have to take that into account, that their model is not reality. And that's really important. And, and modelers sometimes get really into their modeling. And because I don't make these models, they're not my children, they're not my models. I can be a bit more dispassionate about them. Um, there's a lovely quote from uh, George Box. So the, George Box is famous, very famous for a quote that says all models are wrong, but some are useful. But there's another wonderful quote he had, which is that scientists are like artists. They have an unfortunate tendency to fall in love with their models. <laughs> Actually, I'm reading, reading this notebook this morning. I also came up with another um, one that you'd said, which you said, there's always a discrepancy, um, yes. which I thought <laughs> was kind of... Um, in, well, I think we might do that poem, but I in the I sort of thought it before, and then we'll, Peter and I'll just close. But I thought you might want to see this. These are the books that I kept, which were very huge and kind of colourful. Can does that look visible? Yeah. And so I'm going to. Oh, see, sorry. My, my notebooks just have the odd equation. In them. <laughs> well, that 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 I think that was just because I was trying to process what what was all this new stuff that was coming into my head in these shapes that I didn't have any boxes for. But I I'm going to um, read the poem that's called "The Three Gods of the Heart," and um, Sarah Sarah's going to show the close up of the picture. And this was very much what what Peter was discussing that the idea that a, a model taking taking a computer model into a mathematical model could make it so fast that the surgeons could use it to guide themselves during um during the operation but i was very struck by the idea of the different nature of um the the creatures the computer model the mathematical model and the actual messy heart the three gods of the heart the mimic heart will learn to sit in a surgeon's hand, ectoplasm in the form of a phone. It's fast as rats. It tots at the risk in every alternative future, burn or leave. The real heart sleeps a ragged sleep like a dog by a fire. It's the father we were told to love, slow with heavy maths. Once in a while we find the funding to make him lift his occult platinum gaze and churn his thoughts across one careful question, like an eclipse traversing. The cost is huge. The birds stop singing. He takes half a week in the transect. Every light squibs. Here and now the gobshite sun is flush with information, distributing it all over the shop, plus or minus his cut. On the table is the offering, a tenuous box of blood. In its panic mess, you can hardly distinguish chamber from valve, unplat the lumpy piping. It's nothing but spirit from which the surgeon is burning away the scars. The heart's electricity will test it like a halo or wings. The nimble son of man is near at hand, the absent father saying little in a supercooled warehouse. Wish us luck. Thanks very much. And I think we maybe need to stop talking, Peter, although I could easily <laughs> carry on this for quite some hours. <laughs> I think Sarah would, we could eat up the entire rest of this, this session. But thank you so much for the anyway, no, incredibly wonderful for, residency. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you for the wonderful poems. <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah. And we're going to have another um, mathematician now. Um,
which is um, Beth or writing as B.A. Wingate. And Beth's going to read us some of her work. And I've given you Beth's biography, but welcome, Beth. And thank you. And you're all just going to be sad that you've missed her parrot, who is not going to be shown to the audience. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Judy. And I wanted to add, too, uh, that uh, many people at Exeter University enjoyed having Judy around and she uh, gave a reading and con we had a reading and conversation uh, um, at the end of the residency where Judy read a few of her poems. And uh, I, I feel like it was quite a success having alternative views of Gaussian processes. <laughs> so having said that, I'm gonna read uh, two poems. Um, uh, the first one, um, is called This is My Ohio. And um, Ohio is a place in the Midwest of the United States. That's, I grew up on the south shore of Lake Erie. And um, there's a few words in here you might not know what they are. So they're Native American words. <clears throat> Catawba is a Native American word, and uh, it's a place. Um, and um, let's see, the other place is Cuyahoga. So there, Ohio was a place of hills and it had been a great forest. The, the forest had been so vast before it was all cut down that uh, the, the mythology is that you could walk across the, straight, the state and not leave the forest. So um, here it is. This is my Ohio. A late summer of Great Lakes girls with their sweet pink Catawba in antique sherry glasses, their coy freshwater sailing games, brings that puttied smell of the old floor in grandma's summer house, glamour of the cigar trees, long seed pods and sounds of bicycle smears in the gravel street. We hide in the back seat of the old Dodge, cheek to vinyl, the gum wrappers and memories of oily potato, potato chips, thin and veined as bees wings, while grandfather and sons rage at each other over the date of Halloween. Our pumpkins rest in the flat places they created all summer, in the gardens, ladening every road in this crooked Cuyahoga River Valley. Through my window, through my window screens, locust frequencies remind me of something. And for a second, I remember everything, even who I am, until I catch ragged strips of peeled apples, suburban houses with prime siding, and the forests of Ohio, shallow bowls of tango orange and fire engines blurred straight into the equinox, lost in all the hot, tall corn. And the second poem I'm going to read for you um, potentially has a bit of a more, it's not mathematical, but I believe it accesses that part of my personality a little bit more. Uh, it has a kind of a long title, which I often will read twice, but since we have a visual of it here, I think I will only read it once this time. Tomorrow pretends not to understand how today happened. In the Jardin des Tuileries, boys lean over the rim of the toy boat pool. They elbow, they vantage, they wish for ownership of glass bottom ships. Their sisters promenade beneath alabaster lady statues and carry yellow canaries in cages fashioned of popsicle sticks and arable glue. In a moment, all will begin to think of cannabis and springtime's forking orchids. But for now, their parents fold newspaper boats and pretend it will be hours before the paper absorbs the water. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much reading for us I'm, I'm really lovely to I mean it's been both a pleasure to hear you read poetry and a pleasure to talk about maths and poetry and the intersection of the two so you can just get a flavor of some of the great conversations that were available in Exeter with with Beth and Peter and also some of the poetry that 
also comes out of these amazing mathematical brains. <clears throat> so thank you. Well, I'm about to. <laughs> um, I'm going to end with some poems from um, this book, which I'm very grateful um, to Rian and Zoe and Seren for publishing, and I'm very grateful grateful for Sarah's help in all of this. So um, just a taster of that, and then we'll end with um with something else displaying one of our guests' um, multi talents. The first poem is um is a poem that actually also reflects a collaboration, which was a collaboration I did some years ago with the poet Katrina Naomi, also published by Seren. And this is actually from, um, the idea came from a painting by um, Tim Ridley. Post Monkey. As the ship speeds up at Pluto, the earth light sensors blow. Lights fade to pastel touches on your toffee colored fur. The flight recorder picks up your first words three years in, a garble of Merriam-Webster, harsh against the hum. It's not long before a haloed planet sets off some chimpy whinge about a green place and your females smoking red in spring. When you give up hope, the language program hits its stride. More dopamine, more titbits, and electrodes neat incentive. In the slow lane, a terrace of dying suns, you learn to really talk. This one is your lab tech's voice. You're asking about stars. Decades in the leatherette pod, the Sykes designed for you. Turn your muzzle silver and the low grav wrecks your bones. Your tail must be bald as a bike chain, the way you grumble. I transcribed your words on landing, the part with the needle where you're yelling, you're not ready, won't be rushed. The cargo hold opens and you're wiped, then flushed. When I was poet in residence in, in, um, at, in Grasmere at um, Words with, the Words with Trust, it was a place I had lived when I was at school. And um, this poem is actually about a shop that I worked in at the, at the weekends and in the holidays when I was at school called the Lakeland Barbecue. And naturally I went looking for it, but it wasn't there anymore. But it was one of those shops that sold like enormous joints of meat and we all had our own massive long carving knives. And it's also sold cheese and pate and kind of very, it was kind of a very 70s sort of shop. And in the, in the downstairs was a cellar, the larder. In the shop's moist basement, the red wines lay prone in their cool dormitory, beyond the jars of lobster bisque and canned truffle sauce, both Lancashire's sat squat on their wood, tasty and mild, like a pair of underground kings. No satisfaction in breaching the waxed cloth, breaking the stiff robes they were buried in. Only the owner had the right to draw the cutting wire twice through the horizontal before quartering. It was ritual to bear each portion upstairs to the shop. Later, we'd peel the cloth off the soft edge and unpuzzle the grain of the clotted blank face. Down there too was where they kept the unripe moons, which were soft as what's inside a baby's unf unfused skull. In the dark, they would salt to rock and start, start to spin. When at last the old satellite has worn to a nub, an uncut cheese will rise, white and purposeful, with the sun's reflected buttermilk light, to do its work. Think of the store of teeth a shark is born with, which one by one drift to the front of the mouth, to take their turn, they take their turn to be the ones to shine, to bite. The next poem is actually a poem that kind of incidentally sort of came out of the Exeter residency. And I was, although it's not really a mathematical poem, but it was, um, I found when I opened my notebooks, a picture of precisely this, um, the coin. And in the kind of probability that Peter is not um, a supporter of, you use a lot of fair coins. The point being that they are not weighted and they fall equally randomly head um 
randomly head or tail. But the unfair coin is obviously not that kind of coin and is a coin with two heads, although this poem is, of course, already out of date. The unfair coin. There is a face on it. I turn the coin in my hand, the same face mirrored on the obverse. It runs through the metal like a pipe of quartz worming through rock, a cavity filled with its own stubborn light. She is an offering to herself, not a token I have the right to toss and gamble on. Her face, a single face on both sides, a tube of face the coin was sliced from. Inside, the double walls of her teeth will never part. The queen's eye in her face is a tunnel of eye, stretching as far as it needs to. Within the coin, her inner ears listen to each other, part of the same ear, the same tin can, linked to itself across a bedroom with a taut string. Between them is no new information, nothing but bad luck, lies between the double strike of the press. You could die in there, the queen's unending rope of a face streaming through your body like sound. There's quite a lot of things in this book. Um, quite a lot of poems in this book are about things that made me kind of angry. Um, and some of them tied into another sort of bit of collaboration I did with an artist called Wanda Brooks in Derbyshire, where we were looking at sort of edges of various sorts. And I ended up writing several poems about mathematical edges in information and data and, and some about um, moments of change of all sorts, including voting. And this is one of those. The Victory Parade. The dazzling chevrons on my hide say nothing of the kind of horse you'll find beneath the skin. Zookeepers are wise to fear our, chis our chisel teeth, and it was for a joke that I persuaded all the tribes to rise up, split the ground, oh sorry, to kill their flocks and trust the clanking bony dead to rise up, split the ground and set them free. Alive I trot, insouciant, through loops of bunting, the minister's supporters strung between the posts. The devil's here in his usual circus outfit. I let him ride me. He's the only one who can. Today I am respectful, full of stagey mirth, as I lift and point my polished hooves. Even before we knew, clowns were on the turn. All through the previous stinking summer, Nick's cocked ear had been retuning the ground. In the distance, two stripy tents, like nipples topped with tassels, fly the winner's standard. The sky is turquoise. Jesus, what a shade. My hooves are tapping, obedient with felony. Some new concoction boiled over today. <coughs> and I'm going to end with a, um, a kind of more celebratory poem it's a but it's a it's a poem that relates to a time that is already now very distant birthday the day opens like eyes open spreading their willingness generously across the desks polyurethane varnish like butter right to the corners of a cut brown loaf ordinary but brand new and hot che bought cheaping in a white paper bag the day opens like beaks do to show the long pterodactyl tongues of birds in a painting of hell. But everyday birds also have these sorts of tongue, so it's fine. Their throats synthesize honeycomb noises like ingredients piled in a blender goblet, so very ready to be smooth. The day opens like hands, mine dry from the dull work of disinfection to make sure they are holy before I touch my mother's cup. When I meet the mirror, my whole skin closes up again like a jumper felted in the wash. The day opens like a parcel and I have two untouched for 48 hours. People are shedding more with the new variant. The third parcel came today, a small rip flowers to show gift wrap inside the brown. 
I won't be opening it for a while. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Judy. And a massive thank you to our cross-disciplinary poets as well, which is Barbara Marsh, Peter Challoner, and Beth Wingate, otherwise known as BA Wingate. Um, I'd also like to, and a massive, massive thank you to Judy Brown. Like I said, this is a this is our official Saren online launch. It is a wonderful third collection. So for those of you who haven't already bought a copy, uh, Sarah will put a link to the book in the, the chat now. Um, what else would I like to say? Well, also, we have another online launch uh, this Wednesday. Um, so that's Catherine Bevis's um, new pamphlet, her first pamphlet, Domingo. So please try and come along to that one as well. And um, without further ado, I do believe we have a video. Um, is that of the Franklins? Is that right? Yes. Is that is yeah. a new album? Yeah. yeah. So again, another warm, warm thank you to everyone who attended this evening. Thank you so much. And to sing us out, we have Barbara Marsh with the Franklins. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> Glass.
Traffic rumbles on this road to thread. 